What's up everybody? Welcome to another video and I hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. In this video I'm going to talk about the importance of being precise and rigorous when we are constructing proofs but also when we're teaching others how to construct proofs. And I'm going to focus on one specific example and this is something that I've seen recently a lot of people doing when constructing induction proofs. Okay, so I'm going to look at this example, we're going to dive into it, talk a little bit about it, look at it from both a math and a math education perspective, and hopefully you find this video interesting. I think it's pretty interesting to look at, but let's jump right into it. I came across this because I was actually working on a video on proof by induction, and what I do when I'm kind of planning and preparing for these videos, a lot of times is I jump on YouTube and I see what other people are doing, not to steal anybody else's content, but just to get some inspiration, some insight, some perspective, and kind of see how these things are being explained. But what I found is something really interesting. I found a lot of videos where they were presenting induction proofs in a way that I personally didn't think was right, in a way that I disagreed with and had kind of an issue with. And this wasn't just one video, this was quite a few videos, and these videos had hundreds of thousands, I think one maybe even had a million views, a ton of likes, very few dislikes. So then I'm starting to think, well, maybe I'm wrong. If this many people are watching this and liking it, maybe I'm wrong. So I went deep down the rabbit hole, did a bunch of research, and I'm gonna kind of discuss what I've concluded and provide hopefully some insight. I don't know, it's pretty interesting. So let's jump right into it. I figure the first thing I should do is show how I complete induction proofs the way I was taught, as well as the way I plan on showing in my video, and then I'll show the way I see some other people doing it, and you'll get an idea of kind of the difference, and we'll go from there. So here's a very basic example of proof by induction. We're gonna prove this statement. So what we do, we start with our basis step, which is that we show the statement is true when n equals one, right? Pretty straightforward, we get one on the left-hand side, one on the right-hand side, we're good to go. Very easy step. Next, we continue to our induction step, and this has two parts. We start with our induction hypothesis. So we assume that this statement is true when n equals k. So here's my assumption here. I said suppose, and this is that statement when n equals k, right? So I'm assuming this is true, and then where I go from here is that I want to show that the statement is true when n equals k plus 1. So the way I was taught and the way I'm going to show in my video is that we use this assumption to get to what exactly it is we're trying to show, which is that the statement is true when n equals k plus one, right? And that's exactly what I've done here. Since we know this is true, we know that these two things are equal. That means if I add k plus one to both sides, it's still equal, right? Then I just do some pretty simple manipulations on the right-hand side here, find a common denominator, combine these terms, factor out k plus one, that's what happened from this step to this step, and then we're left with exactly what we wanna show, which is that the statement is true when n equals k plus one, right? If you take n here and replace it with k plus one, you get this, and we know this is true because all of these steps follow. Therefore, by the principle of mathematical induction, our proof is complete. So this is where I see people kind of doing it differently and taking a different turn. And actually, I'll just go ahead and write it on the board what exactly I see people doing. So here is an example from one of the videos I watched proving the same statement, but in a different way. And you're pretty quickly gonna see how this is different and hopefully you'll see the issue I have with it as well. So the basis step is the same, the induction step starts the same, they make this assumption that the statement is true when n equals k. This is when it gets weird for me and this is when the problem starts for me personally because then what we do is we say well this is what we want to show which is true, this is what we want to show that the statement is true when n equals k plus one but then we take what we want to show and start manipulating it, right? We say well the sum from one to k is equal to this based on our assumption then we multiply both sides of this equation by two. Then from here, we multiply and distribute and combine like terms and all that stuff. And we end up with k squared plus 3k plus two equals k squared plus 3k plus two, which although is a pretty random equation to end up with, it is trivially true for any k in the set of natural numbers. And then they say the induction proof is done, right? So hopefully you can see why this feels weird to me because it really feels like we've assumed what we're trying to show and we've worked backwards. Right? You can't write out something you want to show, deduce it into something that's true, and then therefore say what you started with is true. If you've taken a proofs course, you know that that's a big no-no. 
right? You always start with your givens and your assumptions and work toward what you want to show. So hopefully you see kind of the problem I had with this. But again, I wasn't completely sure because there were so many of these videos doing it this way and they had so many likes and so few dislikes that I thought maybe I just had a really strict intro to proofs instructor, right? Maybe I'm just being nitpicky. So again, like I said, I did some research and one of the things I actually did was I went on Math Stack Exchange and I posted this as a question and I basically just presented the situation and said, hey, here's the way I was taught. Here's the way I'm seeing other people doing it. To me, it feels sloppy. It feels less precise and less rigorous. Is there something I'm missing? So I figured now I'd read a couple of the responses because they actually provided some pretty good insight. So two people responded to my question and I think they both provide some pretty good insight. So I'm gonna go ahead and read the first response right now. The first person said, I usually handle it the way you were taught. In other words, use the induction hypothesis to prove it's true for n equals k plus one. You can work backwards. In other words, go from the n equals k plus one step back to n equals k as some people do, but I believe it's generally not a good idea to do it this way. This is because this method only works properly if all the steps are reversible. In other words, you can take the steps that were used and also do them backwards. In other words, effectively do the procedure the way you initially described. One main issue I have with teaching students to do it the second way is you need to emphasize the reversibility aspect so it unnecessarily complicates the procedure. Also, students may forget to check for this, thus possibly ending up with an incorrect proof. I don't really see any particular advantage to it and several disadvantages so I would not recommend it. So this was really interesting to me reading it because this is actually something I've never considered. I've never considered if, a, if the steps of a proof are reversible or not, or the reversibility of steps, right? And I think the reason why is because I've always worked proofs from start to finish. I start with what I'm given, I make my assumptions, and then I work toward what I'm trying to show. That was just drilled into me through all my proofs courses I've taken, right? So it's probably the reason why. But if we take a look at this example, what can we see here? All of these steps are reversible, okay? So what we could actually do is we could take these steps, we could label these like one, two, three, and four, and we could reverse the order of these. We could bring this step up to the top here as our first step, and then this will be our second, this will be our third, this will be our fourth, and what we would have is we would be starting with a true statement and concluding with what we're trying to show, and therefore I would say, okay, that is a rigorous formal proof, right? We're starting with a statement that really, uh, it doesn't really make any sense where that would come from, but it would still work. It is true, right? So it would still work. So I think that's what he's trying to make clear here, but I really like that he points out that this isn't probably something we should teach because then we have to go and explain, well, we can do this because it's reversible and this and that, and it kind of overcomplicates the issue. And also students may carry this over into other proofs courses where these steps aren't reversible. And I think it just generally develops bad habits to start with what you wanna show and manipulate it and have that as your final proof personally, in my opinion. I don't think it's good practice, especially if you're in, you know, if you're learning this stuff, you're probably in an intro to proofs course. You wanna make sure that students understand how the logic flows in a proof. And I think it's important to kind of explain that we start with our assumptions of what we're given and we work in a logical order toward what we want to show. So let's go ahead and read a second response because this person actually provides a pretty cool example. He says, as a non-induction example, consider the identity, and this is just a trigonometric identity. We proved these in pre-calculus, right? And he says, most students will proceed something like this, and he shows a list of steps. So basically they've taken the identity, they've manipulated the identity, basically working with both sides, which is something we tell our pre-calculus students not to do, right? And they've resulted in something that's true, which is the Pythagorean identity or a form of it, right? And they will say, therefore, the statement is true. So then he goes on to say, of course, one can make this argument valid by simply explicitly including the backwards arrow between each step, essentially indicating that these steps should be worked backwards. Because if you go back and look at that, the, that identity, you could start with that form of the Pythagorean identity, which is something that we know is true, and finish with that identity that was given initially, therefore concluding that it's true, right? So he's saying using the backward arrow, but it's important that students check that every step can be done backwards. And then he pretty much says the same thing that the other person said. So in short, yes, I think you should teach it the way you were taught. It is indeed more rigorous while showing that 
PN plus one implies PN it is all well and good. If you can self safely reverse the steps, it is absolutely better if the students prove the more relevant implication PN implies PN plus one and know that this is what they're supposed to be proving. So yet another response provided some cool insight, talks about the reversibility. And again, I thought this was interesting. This is something I never considered. And I guess my biggest problem really with the people who are making these videos and explaining the proofs in this way is not necessarily the way it's done. I guess I could live with that. But the bigger problem is that this idea of reversibility and this idea of technically this proof is written backwards or including backward arrows, all these ideas are not included. This is usually simply written out this way. We end up with something was true and then they say, therefore we are done. The proof by induction is done. And I guess that's the main issue I have. And that's the main point I'm trying to make is that if we are math educators, whether we're making videos on YouTube like I do or teaching a class, we should be clear about what exactly it is we're showing and we should think about the implications of what it is we're showing because if we're teaching students to work proofs backwards and not explaining that hey we can do this because the steps are reversible and this and that it could potentially cause bad habits and especially since this stuff is taught in intro to proofs courses that could lead to you know a long chain of bad habits so that's the main point i want to make and i'll make two more points and then finish the video sorry if this was a ramble but the last two points i want to make is First of all, it may sound like I'm all for rigorous formal mathematics and that's all I care about and that is just absolutely not true. I'm a huge fan and supporter of using informal and sometimes even imprecise language to talk about mathematics. But I think we have a responsibility as math educators, and I think it's really important to do this, to be clear about when we are being informal and imprecise. And a couple of things I've done in my videos because I speak informally all the time is first of all, I'll use air quotes, right? So if I'm describing something in a way that isn't precise, sometimes I'll throw in an air quote to make it hopefully clear to the viewer that, hey, I'm speaking a little bit imprecise here. The second thing I do, which is probably an even better thing to do, is after giving some sort of informal explanation, I'll just say, hey, that was an informal explanation, but hopefully it helps you better understand the basic idea of what we're talking about here. Right? And saying that does two things. First of all, it lets them know, hey, I'm speaking informally. I'm not being precise. I'm not being rigorous. But second of all, and maybe even more importantly, it lets them know, hey, the reason I'm speaking informally is because a lot of times informal discussions can help leverage conceptual understanding, right? And maybe they'll kind of get this idea of, oh, he explained that in a way that was kind of informal, but I feel like I understand the concept better, that sort of thing. So that's the first point I want to make before finishing the video. And the second point is, it also may sound like I'm against writing out what you want to show. And it may also sound like I'm against writing out what you want to show and manipulating what, what you want to show. And that's not true either, right? I think there's a lot of value in doing that. I do that in every single proof that I write. I write what I'm given, I write my assumptions, and I write here's what I want to show. But then what do I do? I go back to my assumptions and what I'm given, and I work with those things to hopefully eventually end up with what I want to show right? And again, sometimes I manipulate what I want to show, but I keep that as my scratch work. That is not my formal proof. I wouldn't turn something like this in as a formal proof. I would erase all this, reverse the steps, turn it in. And that's why when you read textbooks, especially with delta epsilon proofs, a lot of times the people who write these proofs seem like geniuses. Where did they get this delta from, right? They got it from the scratch work. That's how we do delta epsilon proofs. We take what we want to show, we work backwards until we figure out what our delta is. We go back to the beginning of the proof. We let epsilon be greater than zero. We pick this delta that appears out of thin air and we look super smart because the proof just falls out from there. When in reality, all the hard work was in the scratch work. So I'm not against writing out what you wanna show at all. I'm a huge supporter of that. I do that in all my proofs. I'm a huge supporter of scratch work and doing all that. But I think if you're turning a proof in and you want it to be formal and precise and rigorous as you should, you should keep that other stuff as scratch work and write out your formal finished product from start to finish. That's just my two cents. So I'm looking forward to hearing y'all's comments. Again, sorry if this was a ramble. Let me know in the comments below what you think. If you disagree with me, um, whatever it is, I'm happy to have a discussion. I think this stuff is really interesting, especially because it talks about kind of teaching and student understanding and that sort of thing. I am into math education, so of course this interests me. And that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed, got something out of it. Like and subscribe if you did, but most importantly, keep flexing those brain muscles and I'll see y'all later.